Hey, it's Luminosic, and it's time for another Q&A. We have some great questions this month, so do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon, where you can find exclusive content and all sorts of premiums in exchange for your support. Okay, so our first question is from Hulu Gulu Gulu Wart Moxalot. He asks, what kind of ailment is Yopo best for? How far can I go with it? What is its general vibe? And what else do you know about it? I would say that as is the case with any entheogenic plant, it's going to be most efficacious at treating neurological disorders. And DMT and ayahuasca have shown particular promise with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, depression, addiction, PTSD. It seems that what the research is telling us is that all of these uh, plant medicines, including the synthetics, are very good for treating just about any symptom with roots in the mind. So. Any neurological disease or aberration, like addiction, that can be addressed by correcting bad neuropathways. The second part of the question, how far can I go with it? Uh, I think it's important to remember that of all the plants that contain DMT, I think Yopo and Wilka are the most difficult physically. They're very strong vasoconstrictors. Also, they have different ratios of the different types of DMT, and then there's a whole host of other active constituents in the seeds. I'll post a link to some clinical analysis that I've seen if I can find them after I finish the video. So in my experience, there does seem to be a ceiling that's much lower than the breakthrough experience that people talk about with pure smoked DMT. Part of the reason for this, I think, is that it's so difficult to get enough. In order to have a strong experience, you need to ingest about a half a gram of seed that has been mixed with snail shell. So it's very difficult to get a lot of it in, it burns very badly. And also because the 5-HO is dominant, uh, the bufotenin, which is the, the most toxic and the least visionary of all of the forms of DMT, uh, this is a very difficult path to have a real breakthrough experience. So how far you can go with it is probably a matter of your personal tolerance for discomfort. As far as the general vibe, my subjective experience is that the reputation that this particular plant medicine has as a sort of uh, gateway to the realm of the ancestors seems to be true. If you've watched my Yopo experience video, I talk about how some guys that I didn't even know very well uh, we had a ceremony with them and one of them took on the personality of my mother and had access to information that only she would know. And there's a, a feeling of a presence that feels very ancient and extremely powerful to me. It's very similar in aesthetic to DMT because that is basically the main active constituents. However, anytime there's a different ratio of these compounds and when they're in conjunction with other types of active constituents, it changes the personality or you could look at it a different way and say that it attenuates the consciousness to a slightly different frequency. So the vibe for me is just this ancient, powerful, very wise presence. The last part of the question, what do you know about it? Uh, the other day I was looking through my videos and I realized that I had never made the second part of the Yopo video. So. I don't want to get too deeply into that here because I'm going to do that pretty soon. Uh, it'll be part of the Psychedelics Masterclass series that I've been working on. But I will say that it is the oldest known plant medicine to have been used by man. Uh, some would argue that psychedelic mushrooms are because this is implied by cave drawings that are older than the pipes that have been found with Wilka residue or Yopo residue. And in order to qualify that, I would say that this is the oldest known for sure because we have pipes that have residue. The paintings just imply the psilocybin mushroom. So it's been in use for at least 5,000 years and it's also very widespread. And when this happens with a plant that requires specific and complex methods of preparation, it's very intriguing to me that it was ever discovered at all, much less on you know Caribbean islands and in the Amazon rainforest and in other disparate places around the globe. So. That is sort of indicative to me that these plants are communicating with us regardless of whether we're actually ingesting them. It's like they extend the invitation and instructions, maybe subconsciously, and those that are able to listen can discover these, these medicines as the indigenous have throughout history. Okay, the next question is from Empty Rainbows, and it is how deep can someone go with Wakuma? 
That's an interesting question, and it comes with a bit of a warning. Uh, how deep you can go is going to depend on the individual, but there is a characteristic of San Pedro cactus in particular that can make this a little bit dangerous. And if you're going to take really high dosages and push yourself to the limit, I strongly suggest that you have not one, but two people <laughs> at least that are not going to take as much, if not none because uh, it's very common for people to black out at high doses. I have decades of experience. I've taken high doses of just about every psychedelic you can name. And I have been overwhelmed only by San Pedro, except for once with an extremely high dose of psychedelic mushrooms when I was much younger. I've seen this many, many times. People end up naked and raving because I think there is potential for tremendous value to take the highest possible dosages of some of these plants at least once in your life. I wouldn't necessarily caution you against pushing it, but you definitely want to do it slowly. I would recommend, you know, processing a bunch of cactus all at once so that you can have several journeys and sort of build yourself up so that you can determine where your boundaries are. Having said that though, I will tell you a little bit about my experiences with taking San Pedro to the absolute limit. I have gained some capacities and insights into the workings of consciousness and possibly even into the secret workings of the universe in this way that I can't imagine would have been communicated to me in any other way. And there are two in particular. Uh, once I took a moderate dose actually of San Pedro, but this is one of the greatest gains that I've ever derived from psychedelic experiences. <clears throat> I was performing a show and I was able to compartmentalize my consciousness so that I was able to focus entirely on my diaphragm and control and sculpt my vibrato. I could also focus on my picking hand and my fretting hand on my guitar and relate to the rhythm section. Like I had all these different windows and it's as if my full consciousness was focused on each of these areas. And after the fact, I'm still able to do this to a much greater degree than I was prior to the experience. So that's the kind of thing that you might gain from even a moderate dose. That wasn't really a high dose. As far as the high dose experience goes, this is something that I've actually heard from several people. This is not a unique experience to me. I think this is something that Cactus tends to show people quite often. And it's very difficult to describe, but it was as if suddenly I was in a sea of these little yellow dots. And I recognized them immediately as individual units of consciousness or photons. And in my journeys with Western esoteric practices and and Gnosticism, I had already come to kind of understand that light was kind of the central secret, that, that consciousness is actually a property of light, that there are only really two things in the universe, light and darkness. And so I was a part of this infinite sea of these tiny little particles, and at one point I realized that I could zoom in on them. And when I did, they became sort of like, I think they're called tesseract shapes that are in four dimensions, so one dimension of time, and they, um, you can never see the whole thing all at once. And as I moved it closer, I noticed that it had a ton of detail and I could sort of move it around and consciously manipulate this unit of consciousness. And there was a tremendous amount of information that I, I'm not gonna try to articulate in this space, partly because I already made a video about it, that was exchanged with my consciousness by interacting with consciousness in this new way. And then the cactus, you know, it can have a voice sometimes. It said, watch this. And there was a particular line of these units of consciousness that suddenly was gone. And that included me. Suddenly my consciousness just blanked out. And this, the warning aspect of this is that this actually did represent a blackout. And when I came back, it was as if I had actually experienced nothingness. It's not like I went to a place of darkness or a place of clear light. It was actual nothingness. And so I asked the cactus, what are you trying to tell me with this? Because I understood that these were like particles or possibilities that had been fulfilled and just one of them had been moved and this totally terminated the chain of events that led to the creation of the universe and me and all of this stuff. I said, are you saying that this, that creation is actually a happenstance, random occurrence? And it said, no, I'm trying to show you how intricate and perfect the conscious process that brought you to the experience you're having now is and how specific that development had to be. So 
I guess my response to your question is that you can take it really far and there's a lot to be gained, but you need to be cautious because as I said, this blackout has happened to me and several other people that I know that have experimented with high doses of Wakuma. Okay, the next question is from Vlad. And it wasn't so much a direct question as sort of a conversation that culminated in the implication of a question, which is basically this. He felt that his experiences around shamans and people that consume plant medicines indicated that enlightenment can't actually be gained from experiences with these plants. And I do disagree with that, but only in part. I think that the intention of a person that comes into a psychedelic experience has a tremendous amount to do with what is actually gained. The brain needs directions to create these new neural pathways. Of course, in a lot of cases, it may be that someone without any intention still has an experience that opens them up to a greater reality, a greater consciousness. But the chances of that are greatly lessened if the person comes to the plant specifically for just the experience or for some other reason. So if you don't have a clear picture of what it is that you're trying to gain, chances are that you may not gain anything. Also, I've noticed that with different plants, uh, the mushroom, the cactus, ayahuasca, they all have very different personalities and also very different effects. They are all potentially good at healing the same type of issues, but some are better than others for certain applications. Some also do not contribute the same type of enlightenment that others do. I have noticed that people in the States, for example, that are part of the psychedelic culture that take LSD or psilocybin mushrooms tend to have this sort of unification kind of idea. The orientation of their consciousness goes from a self-centered, survival, ego-based kind of disposition to a collective-oriented disposition. With ayahuasca, a lot of times, this doesn't happen so much, I've noticed. People do heal emotional damage, and they may have insights into the deeper workings of nature, but oftentimes there's a tremendous ego explosion. So, basically, what I'm saying in response to this question is that yes, I do think that these plants can lead to different types of enlightenment, but the reason I advocate having so many different types of experiences and also incorporating practices from other traditions like meditation, study of the sciences, a holistic approach to self-enrichment, self-directed evolution, in conjunction with a variety of plant medicine experiences, if you're really looking for a holistic experience of enlightenment. The last question from Mr. Dildo Faggins, um, what is higher consciousness? Well, Mr. Faggins, or I hope it's okay if I call you Dildo, um, <laughs> this is a very difficult question to answer, and I think that my experience has dictated to me that there are many different forms of enlightenment, and there are many, many different levels of enlightenment, and in the type and degree of enlightenment that is appropriate for one person may not have applied to another. So I will answer this question in reference to what I'm hoping to see evolve in the collective of humanity. There are certain experiences that you can have that encourage the understanding that the collective is as important as the individual. And there was a mathematician, I can't recall his name at the moment, but he mathematically proved that if everyone was more giving, in the end, you know, it would happen more slowly for the individuals, but in the end, everyone would derive greater benefit. Uh, the Grateful Dead proved this with their business model. They treated every part of their organization as it was just as important as the band. They paid their roadies six figures a year when, you know, bands like Aerosmith were paying nine dollars an hour. And it took them longer to amass wealth but ultimately, they were the most successful touring act in the world for a very long time. And so, this mentality actually works. Hey, look what joined us. I wonder what it, ow. Apparently it bites. <laughs> so for me, right now, the most relevant and important aspect of developing a higher consciousness is the hope that people will continue to have these experiences in greater numbers that lead to this understanding that placing the collective at the same level 
of importance as the individual will actually ultimately empower the individual to a greater degree. This fear-based mentality that we have developed to protect ourselves is actually hurting us and we're working at cross purposes with ourselves. So my studies particularly with people that are engaged in a sort of Gnostic practice, and I use that term very loosely. Uh, people have occasionally misunderstood and assumed that I'm actually a Christian Gnostic, which is definitely not the case. I, I use the term only because it, it implies that we are accessing divine revelation without a book like the Bible, without a church, without a priest, by our own mechanisms, by our own impetus, without even a religion to create strictures and limit our progress. The other really important facet of evolving your consciousness is that I know it is possible to develop a deeper understanding of the wiring under the board, the apparently hidden processes of the universe um, this deeper understanding does empower us to relate to the universe in a more holistic way, in a truer way, and generally we will find ourselves just sort of automatically functioning in a way that is more harmonious with the natural world, with the people that we interact with around us, and incidentally, uh, part of this process that I also find really interesting and valuable is that I think it's a very common experience for as you work through your traumas and you expand the parameters of your experience, you start to experience things like precognition, telepathy. I just saw an interview with Paul Stamets, the famous mycologist. I had no idea that he was a serious scientist. And something he said during this interview it was on Joe Rogan's podcast. He mentioned that he had had this precognition of all these dead cows that he wrote the date down when it happened on mushrooms. And on that date, there was a big flood. He had to go to his cabin to save his research papers. And as he's going back to town, the river had flooded and deposited all the dead cows that he had seen in this vision. It was exactly the vision and it was the date that he had written on his calendar. More important, maybe, he mentioned that as a scientist, he hadn't spoken of this until the Joe Rogan show because of the condemnation and ridicule that he might have suffered from his colleagues. And so if we're looking for a more holistic, more complete, higher view and understanding of the universe, and we know that we live in this oppressive intellectual and spiritual climate, I think it should be evident that the value of this evolution of consciousness can't be understated. For example, in case of a revolution, a telepathic hive would be much more difficult to control. I think this is a big part of the reason that the powers that be have suppressed these medicines for so long. It's a massive threat for us to increase our intelligence to free us from our fears and acquire new capacities of mind. That is an empowered populace that I really don't think that the world governments are really inviting. So do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, and keep an eye out for my next video, which will be about psychedelics and the occult. Thanks a lot for watching.